I poured you a drink Would you sit down and talk with me Lend me your ear and I'll bring you along We can split the day rate 50-50 Oh baby I get by Oh and all I need is somebody yeah. Oh I'm gonna get high Welcome to the Pro EDU Podcast. Talk and drink with your favorite artist. So grab yourself a cold sarsaparilla, take your pants off, kick back, and enjoy. I don't know about you, I'll take comfort in that. We are live with season 10, episode two. I am joined today with portrait photographer, Aaron J. Young. Aaron, thank you for taking some time to uh, talk to me about your photography. Sure, thank you for having me. I'm excited to get into it. Are you, um, you're in LA, yeah? Uh, today I'm in LA, yeah. I also live in Palm Springs, so I'm, I'm back and forth like almost weekly. That's awesome, that's awesome. Yeah, I think the first time we met was in Palm Springs several years ago, right? Yep. Yeah, you were. Yeah, we met physically in person. Yeah. 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 So <laughs> Palm Springs is a very interesting and hot place. I had no idea it got to 125 degrees every single day during the summer. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's intense. You kind of have awesome. to like so, stay close to the pool. <laughs> yeah, every place there has to have a pool. It was just like, if you if you have a house yeah. in Palm Springs without a pool, you're, <laughs> you're kind of screwed. You're not doing it right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so let's let's back up. You know, one of the things that I always start with with a lot of these interviews is like how you got into photography. So, I don't know your actual story of how you got into photography. So let's start there. Like, how old were you, and and what was the thing that happened that where you knew like I'm going to become a photographer? So about 14 years ago. So um, when I was in my early 20s, I was visiting um, Palm Springs, visiting a friend in Palm Springs. And this was when I still lived in Pennsylvania where I grew up. And he was a photographer. And um, when I was visiting, he had a couple of photo shoots that he was doing at his house. And um, they were like portrait photo shoots. And I um, was just taking some like behind the scenes stuff with one of his old cameras. and that was kind of the beginning. Like that was the first time I ever picked up a real camera and uh, ever tried to take a good photograph. Um, and from there, it, I mean, that sort of sparked this passion, this new passion. And then um, from there, I just uh, kept going and like it kind of took over my life, I would say, <laughs> from there. So did you ever, you know, go to school for it or how did you learn? Um, did you, you know, mentor under someone else? Did you work in a studio? So starting out, I was just self-taught. I mean, mostly I would say like 99% self-taught. Um, I, uh, I just experimented a lot and, you know, kind of honed in on portraits as the thing that I was the most passionate about. Um, and I've done... I believe one or two workshops in my life so far, (laughs) which were huge. They were monumental. Um, They were uh, with Felix Kuntz, who's now a friend of mine, but um, God, it's it's been a while. It's been maybe not quite 10 years, but maybe more like eight years ago or something like that. When I I took uh, a lighting workshop with him, that was like a game changer for me. Um, And uh, the rest was mostly just like learning online, lots of YouTube videos, uh, uh, making friends who were photographers who were, you know, much more experienced than me and then kind of learning from them just through getting together and, you know, 
playing around with stuff. So. And yeah. the other workshop, did you teach one with Johnny? Yeah, yeah. So Johnny and I taught a workshop together. Oh, um, that's what I this thought. this was within the last couple of years. Yeah. yeah so yeah. is Johnny the wildest person you've ever met? Because I think he's <laughs> he might be at the top for me. Um, the wildest person. I don't know if I'd say wild. You know, he's definitely got like a side of him that can be wild, but he can also be you know incredibly zen and grounded and. Um, yeah. So he's kind of a he's got, he's a nice combination of of like wild and wild and then uh deep and like introspective in a way that's really cool yeah would would you say you guys have a similar style of uh portrait photography or did i just offend you <laughs> no that's a i take that as a huge compliment i mean we have i would say technically our styles are fairly different um the thing that i think makes them similar is uh, our uh, ability to connect to connect deeply with our subjects. So I would say the thing that's similar in both both of our work is that um, there's this this strong uh, human connection coming through the photographs. That's really powerful. Um, and then from there, I mean, you know, I I tend to light things in a very soft painterly way, and I think Johnny oftentimes um, will use sort of like a more high contrast sort of uh, a little bit harder light um, in in how he does things. So, yeah, I would say it's more, our similarity is more, I would say, in the energy that we portray coming through, like how we sort of photograph people. Um, and then on the technical side, I would say we're, we're somewhat different. Nice. So did you ever think that you would become like a, a product photographer or anything but portraiture? Did you ever go down the road of another genre? Uh, briefly, I mean, like I've done a little bit of like real estate photography a long time ago. Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't something that like I pursued. It was like, it was like a friend who was selling their house was like, knew that I was an aspiring photographer and like talked to his real estate guy and was like, hire him to photograph the house. <laughs> and then from there, like I photographed a few other houses through the same, per through the same real estate agency. Um, but it wasn't something that I pursued outside of that, you know, like I didn't go hunting for those jobs afterwards. Um, so yeah, I would say mostly I've, it's, it's just been, um, portrait photography my whole career. Yeah. I mean, early on, you have to take those jobs. Like I, I was, I was doing anything and everything when I first, you know, fell in love with photography. I, it didn't matter what it was. I'll, I'll take them, <laughs> you know, like, well, yeah, I mean, I just, I, I wasn't yeah. getting any jobs cause like I yeah. was terrible at marketing and everything. So it, you know, there, it wasn't like, I wasn't, I was not only not getting, uh, photography jobs. I wasn't getting any other kind of jobs either. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah it's so, so hard to make it. I mean, it's so hard to make it as a photographer, you know, like it's so hard. So maybe let's start yeah. there too. Like when did you feel like you were like, all right, I, I think I can build a career out of this. Like what changed? Like, where were you? Well, I mean, I would say like from, from the first few months that I first picked up a camera, I started thinking about it as like a, you know, maybe I could do this for a living. Um, it was, you know, I didn't know anything about anything. So I was like, I don't know how that's going to happen. I don't know how I'm going to make money. I don't know how I'm going to charge for this. Um, so I, I mean, l luckily when I started, I had like another career going so I could, I could take my time sort of with the, with getting photography going and have an income, which was, you know, incredibly valuable because I didn't have to like, I didn't have to completely stress myself out over the money aspect of photography. Um, you know, now the money aspect is more stressful because it's all, it's like my sole way of making an income. <laughs> So, you know, I'm not, I'm, I don't have anything else that I'm like falling back on. Um, but for quite a few years I did. So it allowed me the luxury of being able to sort of go at a slower pace, but I don't even want to call that a luxury because it, it also allowed me to succumb to a lot of my fears and insecurities and just sort of take a long time to really overcome those. Um, if I wouldn't have had anything to fall back on, I may have had to push myself a little harder to just sort of be uncomfortable and make something happen faster for myself, but you know, 
So if you weren't a photographer, what would you be doing? Uh, if I was, I mean, so before in a previous life, I was a personal trainer, massage therapist. So I could have easily just kept doing that, you know? Um, but if I would have followed a passion that was greater than that, I would have probably gone back to school and got a master's in like psychology and potentially become like a therapist or something. Along the Ooh, I'd, I could see you in like a really good turtleneck collection, you know, kind of sitting there in a really nice chair, unpacking people's lives. That'd I would be, I, I would be a psychotherapist <laughs> with my own personal line of turtlenecks. <laughs> that right? I would, yeah. I can't pull off a turtleneck and I want to so bad. <laughs> just doesn't, That's surprising because I feel like, I feel like everybody can pull off a turtleneck. I, I, I think I might need your guidance on get the right turtleneck. If we're ever in the same place again, I should photograph you in a turtleneck. We should prove this, oh, prove this idea wrong. Please. <laughs> so... All right. So when you started making, I guess, success out of photography, were you doing something differently? Was it the, your work? Was it your networking? Like, like what led to your success as a photographer? Uh, I mean, honestly, I struggled for quite a few years in having consistency in bringing in money, basically. So I would, I would be, you know, busy for a, a little while, like, I don't know, a month or something. And then I would um, make some money, feel really good about the fact that I was making money, feel like, oh my God, this is it, like it's happening. And then I would spend all of that money. And then I would be in the same stressed out place I was like a month before where I was like, okay, now I have to make a whole bunch of money again. Like it was this, it was this cycle of like overwhelm of, of bringing just enough in to sort of get by spending whatever was left and then creating this cycle of stress <laughs> that was just ongoing. Um, and it was really during the pandemic that actually changed everything um, because the, I mean, leading up to the pandemic, like I was, I was making stuff happen. Like it was this consistent, slow, like climb of, of getting more consistent work. Um, it, I mean, all of this is so closely related to, for me, in terms of like facing my shame and my insecurities and all my issues around self-value and self-worth that so as i continued to do that personal work it, it affected you know my business in a positive way so um so i kept i kept growing and i kept getting more you know every time that i would do another shoot that would be another potential person that would you know there'd be word of mouth there would be um I was slowly marketing myself more and being willing to sort of put myself out there more. Um, and then the, a big thing that, that, that sort of pushed me along in a big way was hiring a marketing team. Um, because I just realized that marketing was like this area where that I just sucked at. And, um, I, I basically made, made the, the call that it would be worth it to bring on a marketing team that could then sort of take over that aspect of my business and really like push me out in a way that I wasn't able to do for myself. So for the last, I don't know, four years now, I've had a marketing team that takes care of all of the like social media marketing. Um, so that's like Facebook, Instagram, Google ads. There's been times where it's covered um, LinkedIn. Um, and also just like making changes to like, cause I have a, I have a website that's just like my portfolio of work basically that's more editorial kind of driven. And then I have a studio website that I built with their guidance so that, um, so that I would have a website that if somebody came across this website, it would be very clear that they could hire me. Um, so there's like lots of calls to action. There's testimonials. It's just like, it, it I, I realized that like my other website there wasn't a lot going on that was really, you know, inviting people to hire me. Like, um, so that's another thing that I changed that has been really helpful in my business. Um, you know, and then it's like, you go along and you just don't give up. You just build momentum, I would say. So um, in, in building that momentum, you just keep the ball rolling in the direction of building your business and building, you know, your skills and everything. And I remember somebody a friend of mine who's an artist of a different kind um he 
told me years ago, he was like, you know, a lot of times it'll take somebody about a decade to go from like starting something to becoming successful enough to like, you know, to consider themselves successful. And that was pretty much what it was for me. It was about a decade of just continually showing up for the process, working on myself on a personal level, working on my business. And then there was sort of a tipping point where, um, where I consistently became busy, I would say. And then, um, so for the last four or five years, I've been in that space. I would say I've been doing photography solely as my career for about six years now. And then a couple of those years was still part of that sort of struggle. And then there was like a tipping point where um, I became, you know, consistently busy and I just, you know, it's been that way ever since. Nice, nice. I love that story. Um, so in terms of like how you make money, there's a few ways in photography, like, I mean, commercial licensing, like prints, day rates, are you kind of doing all of the above? Like how, how do you charge your clients? So the, the primary, like the biggest part of my income comes from just doing like photo shoots. And those, most of those photo shoots are, are like the thing that keeps me the busiest is um, what I call like everyday portrait clients. So that's like somebody who just, has a need or an interest in a photo shoot for whatever purpose. I would say like 85% of the time or 80% of the time, that's like a, a professional lead driven thing where it's like somebody who's an author or whatever, whatever they do for a living, like they need um, portraits for their brand or for their business. Um, and then there's people who um, they're inspired by whatever's going on in their life. Like it could be some, some traumatic life experience. It could be some really good life experience that they're having and they want to sort of capture themselves at this moment in time. Um, uh, and then there's, you know, there's other stuff, but uh, that's like the primary, the bulk of how I make money. Um, and then there are other things that come along that are just not as regular as that, um, that are like, you know, could be something like editorial, it could be something commercial. Um, it could be something like, uh, I don't know, I've done things where it's like could go to an event for three days, that's like a big corporate event, and they need somebody to like, take headshots for three days of 250 people, you know, so those jobs are like, they're super simple, not very creative at all. Um, but they're like a moneymaker, you know, because you're photographing so many people and, you know, if you know how to charge for it, you can like that, that's a great job, a great gig to have, you know. Um, I would gladly do a lot of those gigs just because, you know, they're easy and they bring in, they bring in a good amount of money. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's kind of funny. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to tell the story of me <laughs> introducing my sister to you because she needed someone, because I think this is hilarious. Oh, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I forgot about this. Yeah. <laughs> So my sister Anna lives in LA and I mean, she knows kind of what I do, but you know, not a lot about photography. And she's like, Hey, uh, I have this friend or a friend of a friend who's super wealthy and they need this like epic photo to be done. And like, you were the first person that came to mind. And she also told me right before, uh, money's, money's not an option or mon money's no issue or something like that. I'm yeah. like, okay, so he's super wealthy dude. So I'm like, all right, you know, like Aaron would, it would be the best. It's going to be an awesome like heirloom of this like grandkid that they were going to like print real big or some shit. And I remember like introducing you guys. I was like, I'll let you take it from here. And then like a day or two later, she was like, yeah, the guy was like, that's too much for photography. I'm like, I thought this dude was like a multi billionaire. <laughs> and it's just like, oh, <laughs> it's not even like, it's not that you're charging an insane amount, but you're charging like your worth. And it's not yeah. cheap. No, yeah, it's, it's funny. Like, I've had that. Um, I had a client here in LA who was, it, I photographed a whole family and very, very successful grandparents. I don't know what the kids did for a living, but the grandparents, it was the house that we were at. And, you know, like top level, like, you know, 1% of the 1% type thing. And um, money was no object. And it was funny because it, when they came back with wanting like, I don't know, 30 some images or whatever from the shoot, she she also said like, we've never paid this much for a photographer before. And they were like, not, I was just like, 
I mean, at this point, it's like, of course, like that's the, that's the sticking point more mostly with, with whether or not I get a job is like wh whether or not the client either values it enough to pay what, what I charge, or if, I mean, there's just people that, you know, just can't afford everything. So, um, you know, there's times where they're just like, I can't afford that. Like, and that's cool. Like, I respect that. It's not going to make me like, you know, reduce my rates, <laughs> but I, uh, you know, I'm okay at this point with not being something that everybody can afford, you know? And when I started, I thought that I needed to be something that everybody could afford, which wasn't realistic because it was like, there was, there's no way that I could have ever not only sustained a business without burning myself out, but, um, there is no way in hell I could have had the life that I have now if I would have been charging what I charged when I started, you know, it just, it just, yeah. Burnout, possible. burnout is, is, I mean, in every industry, but photography in particular, like it turns into like something that you love to something that you hate and it can happen like really quickly. Cause yeah. The stress of like doing, especially like if you have a few bad, bad clients here and there, Oh, it makes you not want to do the thing. Well, yeah. And if you're already like, if you're already secretly uh, resentful for what you're charging and you're already like, I like it already feels like this massive amount of work that you're doing for a little bit of money, then yeah. Then, then any, any issue that arises becomes a huge issue because you're already pissed off. You're already like feeling like you're, you're not making enough money. Like you're already stressed about different things. And so it's like, yeah, you're kind of setting yourself up for that, you know? Yeah. So how do you know, like pricing has always been like, you know, when I first got into commercial photography as a producer and uh, a retoucher and just as like an assistant, and I got to overhear some of the, the conversations of like, how much is this per day? Like, it's crazy at like a certain level, it just becomes so expensive and everyone's mm -hmm. cool with it because yeah. it's, you know, for a huge corporation. But, you know, for things like portrait photography and like, you know, you're in LA, how do you know how much to charge? Are you, you know, are you calling other people? Are you doing your own research? Like, how do you know what to charge? So, um, I mean, the, the big thing that, that shifted for me with that was I discovered, um, Sue Bryce, like, I don't know, maybe seven, eight years ago. And that was the first time I saw anybody talking about, um, like undervaluing yourself and valuing what you do. And like, um, that blew my mind initially because I was like, at that point, I didn't know what to charge. I was just super undervaluing everything. Um, and, but I, I guess I just, I, I mean, I liked what I was hearing and I was like, oh, this is really cool. There's like a huge potential here to, you know, to make a really good living. Um, and uh, so that was also like a slow journey of just like taking in the information and then choosing over time to just start to increase my prices and face those fears and all that discomfort that, you know, comes up as a result. And, um, now I, yeah, I've got a couple of friends who, um, have been doing this longer than me who are more, um, experienced in like the commercial editorial world than I am. And so I will frequently go to them to, I also like, I know that there are people who they, they don't undercharge, like they're charging like, like top dollar for what they do. So those are the type of people that I actually want to inquire with. Like, I won't bother wasting my time, like asking people who I know are going to be undercutting themselves, like what their advice is, because it's just, it's a waste of my time. So I will go to the people that I know are charging top dollar. And, um, because like my concern went from uh, being concerned that I was going to charge too much to now I'm just concerned I'm going to charge too little. And so I want to make sure that I'm always charging like what is, uh, I don't want to, I, you know, I don't want to be crazy and I don't want to be like, I don't want to be trying to take advantage of anybody ever. I just want to make sure that I'm not undercutting myself with when I'm, you know, faced with some sort of gig that like I don't have experience with. Um, so yeah, I'll just like, I'll go to, I'll go to them and I'll be like, Hey, this is what it is. Like, what would you charge? Or like, what do you, what advice do you have? And then, um, they'll, you know, they'll give me some ballpark of like, you know, that's the thing when you get into like the editorial commercial world, like there is no like finite guiding thing. It's more like this gray area that there's a lot of things that kind of come into play and things to think about. And so 
even with them, they'll be like, you know, I would charge a, like this to this or whatever. And then you kind of like think about all the factors involved and then you kind of come up with something. So, um, you know, it's like a, it's a weird thing. Like charging for photography is definitely a weird thing because there is like no, just like black and white, like this is what you charge. There's just so many factors that can come in. I mean, you can be like that with portrait photography. You can be like that with like an everyday client. You can have like, just like, this is what my rates are across the board. But as soon as you get into like these other realms, it just becomes, it can get confusing and weird. So. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I, I can't say their name, but I've met a few photographers who have gotten in with the uh, medical, you know, pharmaceutical um, yeah. uh, industry where mm -hmm. a lot of these companies have been forced to spend X amount of their revenue on like mm -hmm. these like marketing campaigns. And they're yeah. pulling in like 70 to a hundred grand a day to take one or two portraits. <laughs> and like, I, I remember throwing up in my mouth <laughs> at that rate, I'm like, you have got to be kidding me. So like, they're just forced to get it out the door to then like yeah. make a portrait of someone who's, uh, you know, a, either a user or a success story of like whatever drug that they're pushing at the time. I just remember thinking like, that is so crazy. Yeah, I mean, so yeah, there was a time when I would hear that and I'd be like, oh my God, like how, blah, blah. like now my first thought when you said that was like, I wonder who I need to market to, to get that job. <laughs> Because like, yeah. if that's available and that's what's out there and that's what the, like a company like a, is, is willing to spend, like, yeah, I want in on that, you know, like why, why wouldn't I want to, you know, figure out how do I get that? How do I get a job like that? You know? Yeah. I mean, it's a lot of, a lot of the photographers that do that are the, the ones that have been doing it for 30 to 40 to 50 years and just have such a good reputation, you know, mm -hmm. of like being able to handle anything. Um, totally. Yeah. Which I, I don't know. Do you think, you know, the, that genre or like that generation of photographer, is that, is that dying off? Is there this whole like new, like photographer, you know, generation coming up that, you know, doesn't really care about, and I'll give you some context. Like Sandro is one of my favorite photographers and a lot of like the greats, I mean, outside of Andy Leibovitz, photographers that are in the early twenties have never heard of. And they're like, I don't know who that is. Mm, <laughs> it's like, these are yeah. like the absolute greats, like Albert yeah. Watson, um, Art Stryber in LA. Like most people don't know who Art Stryber is. Right. It's like, oh my gosh, like these are the greats. And like, because they're not like pushing themselves on Instagram, no one knows about them. But I think, I think I would imagine that that also has to do with like on an individual basis, like each photographer, what they're aspiring who to be in their own career, you know, like. Cause yeah, I found that like when somebody is wanting to have like a successful portrait business where you're photographing like everyday people and that's your goal, then I found like, yeah, it's common to like not know some of those photographers. Um, the people that I've met who are like, have the goal in mind of wanting to have a similar career trajectory as somebody like Art Stryber or uh, whoever like, you know, is doing that kind of work. I feel like those people tend to find those photographers a little bit more, but that makes sense to me. Cause it's like, you know, that's the, um, I don't know. It makes sense in a lot of ways. Like, you know, I'd imagine like, if that's like, for me, like that's kind of, those are the kind of photographers that I look to for my inspiration. Um, because that's sort of like the goal is to, move more into the world of photographing like the influential people of the world and doing more like commercial work and doing more editorial stuff. So, um, you know, and so for me, I, I'm always thinking in sort of like this editorial way, like whatever kind of photo shoot I do, I'm always thinking like, can I capture this person, whoever they are in a way that they, this could be for like a magazine or this could be for, you know, for something in that, in that realm, even though I might be photographing them just for their own business, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about personal projects and your book coming out. So you have a book yeah. coming out, Queen the book, correct? Yes. So, so I mean, the book it. is called, the book is called Queen. Yeah. <laughs> Queen yeah. the book.com. Queen the book.com is where you can pre-order it until it's available to in mass. Uh, it releases December 8th. So right before the holidays. Nice. So, yeah. 
was this is this a personal project like how did this come about and this is is this your first book this is my first book um and it, it's a personal project turned into something more so um i um i used to work uh on the show rupaul's drag race like way back in the day like when basically when i first moved to la and i just was starting my career um through some fucking fluke i got this job to work on rupaul's drag race um which was like massive opportunity for the level of experience that I actually had at the time. Um, so uh, that was like my introduction to the, the drag world. And then uh, a couple of years later, the production company started an event called DragCon that was originally just in Los Angeles. And so I believe that the first year they did it was 2016. And then 2017 was the first year that I photographed it. Um, that year I purchased a couple of booths and then created sort of like a photo studio. Um, and it, it wasn't quite successful in my mind because like my goal that I had was I wanted to photograph, um, I wanted to photograph anybody that was interesting at the event. But one of the things I definitely wanted to photograph was the, you know, some of the more famous Queens. And because we were just like had our own booth and we were just like, you know, we couldn't move around. Um, it was very hard to get those queens to come to us. So that was sort of like, I mean, it was a, it was, it, that was a fun year to do it. And we, we came through with like a portfolio, you know, or like a, a body of work from that year. That was still cool. It was interesting. Um, but it was more of like a learning experience for me than anything. Um, because out of that sort of feeling like, okay, I didn't really accomplish what I set out to do fully. Then came the idea to, uh, see if we could create some sort of like a roaming photo studio situation the next year, which was 2018. And that's the first year of work that actually is in this book. So sort of out of this sort of like year of experimenting that the idea came to like, it was like, could we, could we actually roam around with a backdrop and like a team and lighting situation and go to these Queens who are working at their own booths and um, and that way photograph more of the people that we really wanted to photograph. And, um, and I remember even back then, I remember th having my own personal goal of like one day turning this into some sort of a coffee table book, but that was like a far off kind of dream and with no idea of how that could ever come to fruition. You know, it was just a, just a goal that it would happen one day. Um, so we just started creating the work and we just started doing it like every year that we could that we could do it. So to get this book printed, did you have to pitch it to people? Is this, are you self-funding it? Do you have a publisher? Like, how is this working? So, a re I mean, I had a couple of meetings um, set up through my partner who had uh, just published his own book. Not, he he'd published like, you know, like traditional like book that he actually wrote. And um, so I'd say that it wasn't like a photo book of any kind. And so he connected me to a couple of publishers. So I pitched the idea. They were, you know, they were into it, but they were like, it's not right for us. And then from there, I was like, okay, I don't have any more, I don't have any more connections. So not sure how this is going to happen. And then a publisher found my work of, of like this specific body of work um, because it had been, some of it had been published on out.com and they were specifically wanting to do a coffee table book that had something to do with the drag world. And so they found my work and they actually hit me up. And that's how like our first meeting happened was them finding, finding me. Did you kind of like play it cool? Like, Oh, I don't have time for this. <laughs> you know, to no, I mean, I like, <laughs> I thought it was cool. I mean, I don't know with like anything that shows up initially as a possible opportunity. It's like, there's so many things that just like fall through the cracks. You know, there's so many things I've had that were like, oh my God, this is, could be amazing. And then like do, nothing happens, you know? So until something's like really happening, I'm kind of just take it all with a grain of salt. And I'm like, yeah, like, let's talk about it. Let's, yeah, like, let's see what this is all about and have meetings and stuff. But, you know, it could come to fruition or it could be bullshit, you know? So, um, yeah, I mean, I was excited. I thought it was a cool opportunity. I'm also like, I'm a really big believer in, like you in the in our thoughts create our um 
our reality basically. And so I, at the time I had a whole list of goals that like every morning I would like read my goals out loud to myself and just do a little like visualization of those goals coming to fruition and, or, or more like envisioning, envisioning my life if those goals already had happened. So like one of the goals was that I've published my first coffee table book of the drag work. So it was like, it's already happened basically. That's how I'd sort of write everything up. And um, a big part of that process for me is letting go of how it's gonna happen. So just sort of like putting it out to the universe with intention. And I think there's, I believe there's a huge amount of power in intention. So I put this out with intention and then just do what I could, like what I could come up with to like work towards that goal, but then completely let go of the idea that I know how this is going to actually manifest and be open to the infinite possibility of the universe that like, you know, this could show up in some way that I least expect, which is exactly what happened. You know, I would have never guessed that a publisher would find my work and reach out to me. Like, I thought the only way that this could happen would be like me going to a publisher. So it was just like a perfect example of what I would say is like proving that this is how shit actually works, you know? <laughs> and um, yeah, absolutely. You have to so, manifest it. Yeah. I mean, and it's funny because like, I don't really even use the term manifest that much because I know that it's like... I don't know. People have weird ideas about it. And like, there's that book, the secret and the movie, the secret. And people oh, like, I use the secret to get parking spaces all the time. Well, Before I'm there, I start thinking about the parking space and boom, I get princess parking every time. It's great. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. I mean, I like, yeah. I mean, of course I saw that movie years ago and everything, but I, I mean, since then I've like expanded sort of my ideas of what actually that all is and how it all works. But, um, yeah, I mean, I totally believe in it because it's happened so many times in my life, in in my career, and um, yeah, so that's kind of what happened. I mean, they they found me. We started having meetings uh, quickly. Sort of both realized that it would be a great, you know, we'd be it would be a great partnership or whatever you want to call it. And then that, I think that was like, I think that was like towards the end of twenty nineteen or maybe beginning of twenty twenty when we had like our first meeting. And then, uh, you know, then it was like contract, like, you know, figuring out all the logistics and like, okay, we're really doing this together. And then right after that COVID hit. And so that just delayed everything by like two years. And, you know, without COVID, there, I think this book would have come out probably in like 2021 or, uh, yeah, probably, probably like 2021 at the latest, maybe beginning of 2022. Um, and uh, so when COVID happened, you know, we continued to work at it, but there wasn't like a huge, like sense of urgency because everything was so delayed, and, you know. Um, so what was your COVID experience like? How did you spend, when did, what time did you get up? What time did you go to bed? Well, okay, so mine was, mine was interesting. So um, again, power of manifestation. So I, um, my, my partner is a journalist and, you know, me being a photographer, the second that we went into lockdown, it was like, we are unemployed 100%. <laughs> it was just like, there is, there were no prospects on the horizon in terms of how we were going to make money. It was just done, basically. And um, so I was like, okay, well, I don't want to just, uh, you know, become homeless or whatever. I want to like, figure this out. So I started putting out this intention of like figuring out like, okay, how can, how can I make some income? Like, how can we get through this? And, um, you know, I had some ideas that I took action on, um, that also, I want to say that like part of how this whole like universal thing that I believe works is like, I believe there's a lot of power in taking action kind of regardless of what that action is. Like if you're just sort of like showing up, with to, on your your side of this whole equation with taking some sort of action what i have found is that oftentimes the universe then responds with something that would seemingly look like completely unrelated to the action that you were taking but it kind of gets you there anyways you know like i've had so many times where i was like when i was in that yo-yo state of my business where i was like okay i'm not making any money i'm gonna send out cold emails to 300 people in one industry and I would get nothing from those 300 emails, but then all of a sudden the phone would start ringing 
with people wanting to hire me for unrelated photo shoots. But I just think there's power in like taking that action. So, um, so I was looking at things in that way. I was like, what can I do? I could maybe ramp up selling some limited edition work, um, some prints. Uh, so I started taking action in that realm um, and didn't really, not a whole lot happened. Um, and then I had this idea, uh, why don't we uh, create a mask company from scratch and just start selling masks? <laughs> so um, that's what we did. Like. I was like, I don't know how to do this, but you know, it's something to <laughs> like, it, it'll, you know, maybe make some money. Like, I don't know. And so we found, I, f I found somebody who could, who was a seamstress who was like local. And uh, so we found our person who could like produce the masks. And then that was my little foray into product photography was <laughs> photographing the masks and using my partner as like the, the model. and creating a website from scratch and like just figuring it all out. So in about two weeks, we had like created a business from scratch together and, you know, then just started kind of like anonymously pushing it out through social media and not a whole lot happened initially. And then all of a sudden, somebody who's like a Facebook friend who I don't really know personally saw what we were doing and was like, had a connection to Amazon and Amazon at the time was, I mean, this was like early into lockdown. Um, they were looking for- When we um, were out of toilet paper. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty much like that, that time when, when we yeah. were just starting to be told by uh, the, um, whatever they're called, I can't remember, you know, to, to start wearing masks. Like basically that was the recommendation was to get a cloth, put some fucking fabric over your face basically is what they would say. And so um, there was like no other recommendation than that. So they connected us to Amazon. Amazon was looking for COVID related products to sell, but you had to go, you had to be vetted. Like they wouldn't just let anybody on. So they were like, this looks awesome. Like we're going to put you through the system quickly. And then we got on Amazon and then it was just like, the whole thing just like took, took off basically. So for um, the rest of lockdown for about, I don't know how long it ended up being, maybe eight, nine months, 10 months, something like that. We were like this mask company that we were, we were uh, shipping everything ourselves and um, working eight to 10 hours a day. <laughs> and it was just like, it took off because Amazon is a beast and everybody was freaking out at that moment in time. And we were just like, we couldn't even keep up with the demand. So we were just like, you know, super grateful for how that all unfolded because it allowed for us to be employed, to continue to make an income um, and, uh, you know, to sort of thrive in a way throughout the whole pandemic and right into when, um, you know, I was able to pick up my business a little bit sooner than he was. And so, you know, by the time I was able to start back into my business, uh, the demand had, you know, it had been slowly dwindling basically. So at that point it was easy for him to kind of keep, keep it going on his own. And that happened for another couple of months and then he was able to start working again. So. And yeah. is that company still around or did you guys fold it up? No, we folded. I mean, the, the, the whole goal was to just like, to just have it be like a moment in time, you know? I had no idea that it could ever take off in the way that it did. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, again, it was just like timing more than anything, just having that idea and then having it be like perfectly aligned with what was happening in the, in the world and um, being able to kind of like offer a service that everybody needed at that moment in time. Um, and uh, no, it just like, we knew that like eventually as, you know, more people started, more people and companies and masks started to become like readily available, thank God, you know, and then like better quality masks, like the, and you know, the K95 or KN95, whatever they were called, started to become available to everybody. Um, the demand just started to dwindle and we kind of just wrote it out until we were selling, I don't know, like 25 masks a day or something. And then we were just like, okay, let's just stop basically. Nice, nice. All right. So queenthebook.com. Uh, so 
Will people get them on December 8th or they start shipping then? So like before Christmas? They're going to start shipping up? on December 8th. So you'll get them if you order now up until Christmas, you'll get it. You'll get them like before Christmas if it's like a gift idea, you know? Um, so, yeah. But and these these books, correct me if I'm wrong, but these books have your, it's a scratch and sniff and they have your scent, your musk in them. Is that correct? Or did I make that up? I mean... That would be like slight, slightly creepy. Um, <laughs> well, come but, on. No, you're signing I mean, them, right? You're signing some of them. Yes, we're signing. We're signing some of them. That's what um, it was. I, I mix. I mix shit up all the time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I suppose you could tell the other version on like OnlyFans or something, but um, <laughs> nice. Uh, hey, I mean, a lot of people got rich during <laughs> COVID on OnlyFans. Oh yeah, it's like you're either selling like masks or you're selling yourself, and both or things. Or your toes, became... you know. <laughs> <laughs> or you're selling yourself, your you're or you're selling yourself only wearing a mask. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Both things I think were very successful at that that moment in time. Um, <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> currently on the website, you can get you can get like the book by itself. You can get a version that has my signature, and then you can get another version that is uh, Bianca Del Rio, who's on the cover. Uh, a signed uh, copy with her signature and my signature together. So we've got a choice of nice. three, three versions. Well, I hope it sells out. I, I'm looking forward to getting mine. Um, yeah, I mean, I hope uh, it, it, it's been met so far with pretty good reception. I mean, everybody, especially who has um, seen the book in person, um, seems to unanimously be really into it. Um, I wish that everybody could see the book in person versus, you know, just seeing like a, you know, seeing it online. Um, but uh, yeah, and we're doing December 8th, we're going to be doing a launch event um, in um, Los Angeles. Um, there'll be more details about that rolling out in the next couple of weeks. Um, so but if you're if you're local, you know, and you want to come to that, there'll be a way to uh, get tickets for that. Um, and that'll also be sort of like a book signing rolled into that as well. So if you bought a book and you, or you, you if you want to buy a book there, you know, I'll be there signing copies. Um, and then hopefully we will be doing the, a version of that, um, at a few different cities, you know, like Austin, Texas, hopefully Palm Springs, St. New Louis, York. Yeah, St. Louis on the map. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. You never know. Like, I mean, where is St. Louis? yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, hopefully. I mean, Sweet. yeah, the, the the better reception that it has, the more likely I think we are to travel around and do different events. In it, so. Nice. Yeah. All right. Also, so, I want to mention, too, really quickly yeah. that this uh, the launch event is actually going to be an exhibition as well. So we're going to have about 16 limited edition prints of, of things that are in the book that are going to be available to purchase at this event. And then... Um, uh, yeah, so that's just like another cool thing that we're doing that, you know, as a part of this nice. bigger project. Let's, you want to go through your Instagram? Because I think, yeah, let's do I'm it. doing this with everyone. All right, sweet. I don't think I've ever screen. gone through my Instagram with anybody. You, are you a little nervous? Yeah, there's a slight moment where I was like, do I have anything on there? Do that I want I, this I to happen? Talk about? <laughs> no. I think it's all good, though. All right, so I'm starting with everyone, and I'm just going to start with the very last photo. What's what's the story here? Oh, this is actually cool because I can talk about, like, these are all relevant to, like, the most recent things I've done. So um, one of the newer things that I'm doing is I'm working uh, – there's a photographer named uh, David Sa, um, who uh, a lot of people will probably know from social media, like TikTok especially, and then also Instagram. Um he is starting a studio collective um, in Los Angeles called das, Dasu Studios. Um, it hasn't like officially launched yet. There's kind of like we've been slowly building towards that. Um, this was one of the most recent shoots that I did with Dasu Studios. So they're basically like a studio collective. If you think about them in terms of uh, they are sort of repping me now for like everyday portrait clients. Um, cool. And so, yeah, so this was, this was uh, one of the last shoots that I did um, with them, so. Looks like a 20-year-old Apple box 
I, I only like the old ones. I don't like the new ones. If it's not, I'm 20 the years same. Old, I really only like the old ones that are like the, the the wood, like really like worn out. I'm all about like weathered, weathered props and things. Ooh, weatheredprops.com would be a good business. That would be a good. You business. just every every Apple box has like a whole story. Or you know, it. yeah, like <laughs> somebody somebody could make a lot of money reselling old props because the the amount of times that people hit me up and they're like. Where did you get that chair or that stool or that whatever? And how difficult it seems to be to find like really good, just like classically worn, like wood, wooden kind of props. It doesn't seem to be very easy. And uh, yeah, that could be it. That could be a successful like resale business for someone. Yeah. Weatherprops.com. I'm going to buy it. <laughs> and actually, I'm not. I don't need any more URLs. I have a URL right. problem. All right. <laughs> backdrops. Who, uh, who do you get your backdrops from? So uh, these backdrops are Franklin backdrops. Um, most of the ones that I have currently are Franklin backdrops. Um, I'm about to get an Oliphant backdrop. Um, Those so are nice. I'll be, yeah, I'll be doing more stuff with them in the coming. All right, who's this year. guy? Okay, so this, I, I shot this, this was a super fast turnaround time. So last, last Thursday, I, um, uh, okay, how do I describe this for some of you guys know? Uh, so there's, there is, uh, there is a competition um, that is a, it's international male leather, uh, mis not in international Mr. Leather competition that has existed I since like the, I think since the 80s. Um, or could even be going back further than that. Um, so it's an international competition, but there's local competitions that um, the winners of the local competitions then go on to compete in the thing. So this was in Palm Springs. Um, last weekend was uh, Palm Springs Leather Pride. So it's like the leather community of the queer community comes together. Um, and uh, they had their uh, Palm Springs Mr. Leather 2024 um competition on last friday and so i came in the day before and i photographed the four finalists of the competition and then quickly turned those images around that evening um because they were then used the next day for um like a live a, a silent auction they were printed and framed for this like uh dinner and then the day after that was the actual um competition and so they use them for the competition as well. Nice. And is this Mr. Leather? Did he win it? No. So if you, this one is, if you can scroll through like the, there's like oh, okay. a carousel of images. And uh, oh, that's the nice uh, one. Oh yeah. Here we go. So right. these are the finalists. The next person I believe it was. Yeah. So this is who won, ended up winning the Palm Springs Mr. Leather. If I could rock a leather shirt, I would in a heartbeat. In a heartbeat. You might be surprised. Sometimes you just need to need to try it. So I need to come to this next year is what you're saying. Right. Right. So it's is it always during the summer. Ooh, like that red one. Ooh. <laughs> I do love yeah, oh, I love how that red that pops. One. Um I yeah, I believe it I believe it always does take place. Well, no, no, no. It it I mean, this is what are we moving into are we considered in fall right now? Well, fall has long gone uh, the Midwest. We have so we're, we're in the winter. Of fall and we're we're in winter. I don't know. I'm in in California. You guys don't have seasons. It's just like, like it's just always nice. Yeah, it's just always it's nice. Fair. It's like it's starting to be a little bit cooler, but we still have days where it's like 90 degrees. So you know, um, yeah. Yeah. So this was like a, this was a fun summertime. No springtime. So this takes place. This just took place. So it's this took fall. place last week. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. It, Leather in Palm Springs doesn't seem like that would be the best place to have it. Like, is it just a sweaty mess some years? It's got to be, right? I <laughs> don't know what it's like in previous years because this is the first time I've ever been involved. But um, All right. luckily, the, the evening that I, I went to the formal dinner and luckily, like, it had cooled off quite a bit. So it wasn't so bad. But, yeah, I can imagine um, it could be, uh, yeah. Could be oh, there's... That that looks like Felix. It is. Look at the head of hair. I'm so jealous at right? his head of hair. That just like per perfectly oh. messy look that he's always rocking. It. Yeah, seriously. Like yeah. I haven't shaved in 39 years, and it's starting to come in, but I can't rock a stash like that. Right. Jealous. That with that, I took. Like a, I took. He's got like a mane of hair. 
yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like... <laughs> yeah. Um, right. We did that at the Portrait Masters Conference uh, like a, in September. I just shot that in my hotel nice. room. Yeah. Nice. All right. Tell me when to stop. What is one? Oh, so you do a lot of self portraits. Yeah. I, yeah, I do a lot of self portraits. Um, what, what brought this about and how many, how many frames did it take before you're like, got it? Oh, I mean, it totally depends, but well, I was going to say, usually it's a lot of frames, but I mean, for, for this, I don't think it actually was that many. It was maybe like less than a hundred frames. Um, but, uh, I don't know. I like, I, I, it's I, when I create self portrait, it's anything from feeling inspired through some sort of emotional turmoil I'm going through or something that's happening in my life to this was, this came about because the, there is a, uh, couture designer that I know who, uh, created that piece and, uh, saw the previous things that I had posted and was like, would love to collaborate. So we got together and, uh, they basically dressed me for, for this specific thing, which was super fun. Like I would, I want to do more of that for sure. Um, nice. This, is this your studio? Yeah. So this is my personal studio space. Look at this light. So does it just, this like is the angle and it gets bigger out from there and just huge. Yeah. That's sort of like, it's sort of like the corner unit, but it's just like a weird shaped corner sort of. That's nice. Look at that light. I bet it's just gorgeous. What, which way does that face? Uh, that's a good question. So the sun, the sun rises on the left side, coming through the left, that left window and then rises over the building and then sets through oh, so the right just window. Got great natural light 24 seven. Yeah. But I mean like that photo, nothing about that photo is lit with natural light. <laughs> yeah. It's oh. literally like, comp I completely lit the whole thing and then just wanted to have it look like it was, you know, lit. All right. Any projects that? Oh wait, wait. Go go up to, to go up two things right right there. Right here. Yeah. So that was actually when I photographed the cover of my book. That is that the idea was to potentially. So that's what the the final result was, and then the I the original one of the possibilities was to have the back cover of the book be that image that previous image, to kind of show like oh this is what that that image looks like from behind kind of. Oh, nice. Um, and that's not that. what ended up making the cut. <laughs> but, um, but it was like, it was a cool idea. And I'm glad we did it. And it just ended up being like a cool, uh, a cool photo, you know? Yeah, I love that. We clearly shot this during the pandemic because I was wearing two masks. Are people still wearing masks, like just walking around in LA? Or is that long gone? I occasionally uh, see one. Say every once in a while. Yeah, I mean, I'm still known to do it sometimes because if I'm if I've got something going on that I need to show up for, like that book launch event, I might wear a mask around like the week before because I'm like, I just don't want to fuck around with getting COVID and just not being able to go. Yeah, I kind of want to do it just so I have a reason not to talk to people. You know, I'm, I'm not a big right. public talker. You know, I just want to yeah. like get to where I'm going and don't bother. Oh, wait, me. <laughs> so right there, click uh, over to the right. Oh. Well, OK, that's actually it was a cool thing that I did with. Uh, there's a nonprofit organization called the Guide Dogs of the Desert in Palm Springs. And so we photographed, um, they, they, raise, um, they raise dogs that eventually become um, people's guide dogs across the United States. And they'll have like oh, a, nice. they'll have a graduation ceremony for the dogs where the owners will come and they will uh, meet, meet the dogs that they're gonna end up adopting. Oh, and nice. Yeah, that was like, I love, I, this is some of my favorite kind of work to do. Like I love, I love creating work um, for nonprofits, for like um, just work that like serves a bigger purpose really. You know, like yeah. I, I love, yep. I love being able to do that. And then this, so these are my friends in uh, Palm Springs who opened a cat cafe um, in the last few months. And oh, that's awesome. um, I just thought it would be like, I just thought it'd be cool to see if I could capture an interesting portrait of them with all the cats. And uh, yeah, it was an awesome. interesting, it was an interesting challenge, especially because all of that, 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 like those windows behind them are super reflective. And so it was like, uh, that was a fun one to uh, problem solve. Yeah, reflections. It's never fun. Yeah. Oh, 
It's just about that time of year. I know. I, I it was funny. I you, just, I just, yeah, yeah. This is me and my dog Wilbur. Oh, I've done, I've done three iterations of some version of like me or me and my partner being tied up in Christmas lights. Um, and, uh, I just got hired actually two weeks ago, uh, to photograph a couple and their dog because they saw these portraits that I did of myself and they wanted a version of this. So we did a photo where they are sitting back to back and literally like tied up what it like, like their dog tied them up in Christmas lights. <laughs> so I think I want you to do that for my family. Right. If I could convince my daughter to go along, she's at this stage now. So she's a freshman in, in high school where now nothing I do is cool <laughs> and I'm not funny at all. So well, if I could get her to go along, I think she'd be. Different. We could do it in a cool way. We could have it so that like she tied you guys up. Oh yeah. So she could be like, <laughs> she could literally like be serving like whatever, whatever cool like attitude, like she's over it, like completely over it. We, I mean, that would actually be really cool to create something where it's like her whole thing is like, she's over it and like not interested, but yet, so she like tied you guys yep. up. I'll just bribe her with Lana Del Rey tickets and make it happen. <laughs> exactly. Um, awesome. All right. Well, uh, all right. We're right at the hour mark. So okay. um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Oh, wow. That's like, that was interesting. I know that went quick. We're trying yeah. to cut them down because I'm told that people stop watching after 45 minutes. <laughs> But I, I'm I surprised really people have an attention span. I'm surprised that people can go beyond like the like two minutes. Yes, yeah, no, that's why we're going to cut all this up into like little blurbs and send them to you. <laughs> oh, we'll yeah. I mean, I, I think that's super smart. But maybe in mid December. So we're doing this every day up until basically late January. So okay. maybe at some point when the book does come out, um, I can I can like be Jimmy Fallon, like the Tonight Show and like have it right here. We'll zoom in on it. And, and do that would be amazing. Time. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think that it would be uh, it would be really cool to do something like this. Yeah, once it's out, once it's easier to purchase, like when people can just go on Amazon and snatch it up. I think that would be that'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. So, where can everyone go to follow you outside of Instagram? Are you on TikTok? Are you on other platforms? I am on TikTok, but that's not really gonna get you much because I, I I don't share a lot on TikTok. Um, at least currently, um, Instagram is like the best place because it's like the most frequently updated, like with whatever I have going on. Um, Facebook, I also have, you know, just at Aaron J Young, um, constantly getting new stuff. Um, and, and then my website, I mean, you know, I was like my, I, my sort of portfolio of work website is AaronJYoung.com, And then my studio website, uh, is AaronJYoungStudio.com. I completely forgot about, we have a question if you have time. Um, sure, yeah. What tips do you have for new photographers starting out? Um, that's so such many. a big question. Yeah. <laughs> um, Get an accountant. I mean, depends on like what, ver like how far into starting up you are, but um, I mean, I would say, okay, learn, learn your craft. Look, okay. I'll try to, okay. Um, look at lots of other people's work and hone in on what you're most drawn to in other people's work, because that's probably ultimately like the direction to go in to develop your own style. And even if you try to like, even if you try to completely emulate the, the photographers that you look up to, like, it's actually, I think, kind of hard to like really fully copy another person's work because there's just so much that goes into it from a personal perspective point of view that like it's you'll develop your own style, you know, like you'll develop something that becomes your own. But getting clear about what you really want to create and um, and then going to those sources for inspiration um, is key. And um, if you can find any sort of mentors, whether that's like real life or um online like just people who are teaching um the faster you learn about really pricing yourself in a way that um will sustain you the the quicker you can potentially build like a you know a successful business um so if you can find resources that teach pricing and teach the 
business side of things. And then just know that like when you're dealing with pricing and reaching out to clients and reaching out to potential clients, that is going to bring up all of your insecurities when it comes to self-value and self-worth and shame and any blocks you have around money and any anything you have around your own, I don't know, like connection to creating art and like the personal connection that we all feel to that. Um, so I would say like get into therapy or like explore the world of like self working on yourself um, because that will also be monumental in helping to kind of further along your, uh, your potential for, you know, having a successful career. In the I love world. that. I think we should all be forced to go to therapy. Like it's mandatory. I know like being forced, <laughs> forcing everyone to do anything is bad, but I think in this case, I mean, here's the thing though, like, to to I have done, it would be I good. have done, I've explored so many different kinds of therapy and so many different things. And Talk therapy is, is amazing, right? Like I love talk therapy. There's a lot of other things you can do, like, you know, plant medicine, life changing, um, uh, uh, hypnotherapy, life changing. I mean, there's a lot, a, we live in a day and age where there's so many different massively life changing, potentially things that one can do um, that, I mean, I don't even think you need to like work for years and years and years the way that people used to think that we did to like work through your stuff. Because if you're, if you're willing to like try some more of the radical things, I mean, that's where I've found the most, uh, ultimately the most healing kind of. Kind yeah. Of I'm a big proponent of plant medicine, pretty much all of them. And I, I we're, we're going to have to talk cause I, I do want to go see this guy in Southern Southern California in San Diego that does um, hypnotherapy. And he was on like Larry King and like a bunch of uh, helped the, like the transformation that they've like talked about, like going through this from like a week of work is crazy different. And it's yeah, yeah. to me I like mean, growing up earlier on, I've been in like no fucking way, but I'm definitely at a point in my life now where like, I'm trying everything. Like there's nothing. Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I would, uh, I would find it hard to believe if I, if I didn't, I, I mean, I've already had my, I've already had it, my own experience that was, you know, life changing in a matter of like two days. And so totally it's, it's possible. Um, and it's amazing, you know? And so, um, yeah. And then, I mean, the other side of things is I would encourage everybody. I mean, I know this is more of like a belief kind of based thing, but like, if you're at all into spirituality, um, meditation, um, any sort of mindfulness thing, like that has also been monumental in yeah. Yeah. Um, allowing me to develop a greater sense of focus, which obviously helps in business, um, presence, getting clear with myself. Um, and I mean, now I view that as one of, I mean, like my meditation every day is like, I would say that that is the most important part of my my day because it's like the yeah, basis yeah. of of Same. everything else that's going to unfold throughout the day yep i'm actually uh four weeks away from yoga teacher training graduation so i do yoga every day and also meditate i'd say like three to four times a week but it's huge like it's completely life-changing not only for your body but for your mind like 100 percent. totally life-changing tomorrow i think tomorrow i'm on a string of 110 days straight Nice. I think tomorrow's 110 days. Yeah, I'm just seeing how long I can go without, <laughs> without, without dropping the ball for a day. That's awesome. Well, I'd love to talk more with you. I could probably talk for hours, um, but we will let you go. Thank you so much for taking the time and uh, look forward to talking, hopefully in December when this book comes out. Yeah, I would love to. Thank you so much for having me on. I look forward to, All right, to awesome. chatting again. Thanks. Thanks. Take care. This podcast is officially over. See you next time. Catch you a little later on down the trail, dude. Thanks for listening. I get out of here and start shooting. I can remember very distinctly one of the very first classes. You had to take um, one roll of film and, and tell a story. And you got, you know, four by six prints made of them and you put them on the wall. I remember watching some of the people's images go up on the board and being like, oh my God, what did I get myself into? These people are so talented. 
I was a DJ, I worked a lot at night, sort of felt that itch to do something else. And after some soul searching, the only thing that I was excited about doing was taking pictures. And I, I would Photoshop myself into other places. And a lot of times it never even went online. I didn't care because it wasn't for necessarily the world. It was because I wished I was anywhere other than where I was. I suppose academically I failed everything. So I was left with very few choices. Uh, I was cater waitering. I'd work till you know, 11, 12 o'clock at night, retouch until three or four in the morning. Even though I didn't really have the talent, I'd be willing to work when other people would sleep. And at times I look at my work and I think, damn, I'm a shitty photographer, fuck, it's nothing. You know, you have this idea of what can be done because you're assisting and you just can't create it. You know, so often today's artists, I think we get ideas and we end up sitting on them and we don't follow through. I think we're our, we can be our worst enemies. I will talk myself out of a project before I even begin it because I think about all the things that might go wrong or could go wrong. When you first start out with doing anything, you know, you've got like five people, you know, one of those is your mum following you and it's just like difficult to get accurate feedback. You have to be willing to be rejected by the artwork, by yourself, by your peers. We get worried what our peers are going to think. We get worried what the talent is going to think or what the celebrity is going to think. And for me, it was always like, I understand that, but I also understand that you have to be passionate enough to throw the excuses aside and just start the process. First struggling, then assisting full-time for three years, then struggling some more, then retouching, freelancing, getting my first job. But I'll lay in bed and something will just pop in my head and I just go, what if? Wouldn't it be interesting if? Try it, it didn't work, throw it out. Try it, it didn't work, throw it out. Try it, it works, it works, it doesn't work, throw it out. You know, you don't become a great photographer, you don't become a great painter, you don't become a great sculptor without having some downfalls and, and, and going in the wrong direction. I allow myself to fail because I like to fail because I like to grow. But you have to decide that you want it because it's not easy to be great at anything. Even though I'm not at the place I want to be, I'm still moving forward. Nobody's going to love everything that we do. But I think you have to take a chance.